fear or favor then, I answer you. So much is wonderful in Dante, but if there is a best passage, that uh, is it. Just showing off. But, uh, but anyhow, so even in the afterlife, there are these archetypal patterns. Now, it's not that they rule your life. This is not determinism. That you meet the challenges of these cyclical patterns. You counter them and you prosper while those folks in Nebraska are still picking Saskatchewan potatoes out of the ground and trying to solve uh, that problem. So because you and your ancestors for generations have caught on to the rhythms of the sea and because you have survived and your forebears have survived of a life that inherently contains challenge, inherently contains sea monsters and shipwrecks and drownings and all those tragedies. You have been through, you and your family have been through those patterns of the journey archetype of exile and return and you have had noble heroes in your families who have met those challenges and Dr. Jung has explained that and has honored you with uh, his explanation of that. So you have every right to uh, go forth and to be uh, proud of what you have accomplished. And we began with a couple, how are we doing? Pretty good. Now we, uh, uh, we have taken you through the road of Jung's archetypal patterns. We began with a couple of digressions, so we probably could uh, balance it out by ending with a couple of uh, digressions. Then go to a short commercial, just like public <laughs> TV, and at least it warned you, and uh, then to uh, questions from the audience. So you may be, some of you may be, and we admire skeptics and cynics, and skeptics are also cynics. They get the gold star, or maybe the platinum star, Maybe wondering, uh, am I supposed to believe everything, or even most of the things that this guy says? Well, we go to another source from classic popular culture, from film, to the original Bedazzled in the 1960s, Peter Kirk, Dudley Moore, a, a wonderful allegory on the seven deadly sins and more painless uh, theology in a comic movie than you would ever not. Not the remake with Brendan Fraser, that's uh, pocket change and a few pennies, even though we don't have pennies <laughs> up here uh, anymore, but we can imagine them. So Peter Kirk playing the devil says to poor Stanley Moon, being played by a very young uh, Deadly Moore, or so, uh, Stanley challenges him and, and, and says, uh, George, are you, that's the devil's name in this film, don't play me, George, <laughs> Are you telling me the truth? And the devil says, no, Stanley, I'm lying to you. I'm lying to you right now. In fact, everything I have ever said to you has been a lie. And of course, Stanley being a uh, fry cook in Wimpy's can't handle this paradox any more than he could handle a simpler uh, paradox. But it's not folks like me that you should worry about who try to tell you I've been lying to you all along. No, if you've watched some of that motivational stuff on television or some of these TV preachers, the people you should worry about are the ones who say, I've been telling you the truth all along. And not that I have ever been a charlatan or anything like that, but uh, I seem to have this repressed memory of visits to the Canadian National Exhibition and uh, encountering some of those gullible young fellows from the remote outer provinces, uh, some uh, fellow from, well, a few fellows over the years from Newfoundland that uh, I said, I will bet you double or nothing uh, my $100 to your 50, that you cannot climb all the way up the beam of that searchlight. And this was one of those rare fellows who even having grown up by the sea, 
appeared to be gullible, but he wasn't really. He said, oh no, I know what you're about, A. Eh? I'm not going to go along with this. Uh, that. I said, well, why not? My 100 to your 50. He said, I know what you'd do. I'd get halfway up the beam and you'd switch it off, eh? <laughs> I have to admit, he found me out. So whether you have uh, done so or not, I hope that I have at least fulfilled my promise to, uh, to compliment you genuinely and say it is always a pleasure to be here on this coast in Victoria, and particularly Craig Derrick, the by far, and I'm not just flattering the staff, by far the finest heritage site in, uh, in Canada, and I do uh, support it. We'll try to think of something new and completely different. Baseball last year, anthology to see this year will surprise you in uh, 2019. But we do have a little uh, commercial. There's nothing wrong with a, a memento. We have brought up a few of these um, Julian H. Sleeper House Museum calendars. More text than you might imagine in any kind of museum calendar. And uh, Mr. Hughes, the executive director of uh, Craig Derrick, has given me a permission to offer them to you with, uh, they normally, back in the States, uh, 15 US, and we will offer them to you at, uh, at 15 uh, uh, Canadian, largely because of my, uh, my fondness to, uh, uh, for Canada and the, and the, and the fact that uh, converting the money at my bank is sometimes a bit difficult. But we have, uh, we have a few of them, and that is our, our sole uh, commercial for you. More important, should any of you have, uh, have questions, whether relevant to the speech subject matter or anything you would uh, else like to know, we'll be happy to take a little uh, extra time. The problem is just getting a rhetorician to stop talking. <laughs> but we'll briefly do that in the hope that you will have uh, a question or two. And as uh, Bruce Davies mentioned, uh, failing that, the, uh, the tour <coughs> of the castle is uh, uh, available for those of you who have not recently been uh, across the walkway. But anything you'd like to know, I may know it, I may not, but unlike a politician, I'll admit if I don't. <laughs> yes, yes. When I was talking to you earlier, you said you were born in New York City. Uh, guilty as charged. <laughs> and you talked about the sea. What are you doing in St. Paul, Minnesota? <laughs> Good advice, actually. There was, there were, uh, the Starter Museum, the Humboldt Galley Norman House, was in New Haven, Connecticut. That was open from 1975 to 1992, and it was a case of having an opportunity for uh, early retirement. So that was I, a transition to a larger, better historic house for the established collection. And the doctoral candidate, who was the uh, director of the competitive speaking program at the University of Minnesota, they were trying to do it on the cheap, said, I know you're looking for a place. In one day, I can find you the ideal new building for the next museum. Well, she lied to me. It was half a day <laughs> and managed to uh, find it almost in the Gilded Age theme park, as we say, instead of uh, Victorian down in uh, uh, parts of the United States. So, and uh, she was correct. It happened to be the dream house of an entrepreneur and hotel owner, Julian H. Sleeper, an excellent name for a hotel owner, don't you think? <laughs> and uh, he drove the architect and the builder crazy with micromanagement in a good way. So if you can, if you have the opportunity, buy a heritage house commissioned by a hotel owner who brought his innovations home with him. More to interpret, more to explain about the period from the end of the Civil War until the beginning of the 20th century. I just wish Mr. Sleeper's ghost would come back so that 
we could talk furniture from that era. He can't be displeased with all the 1870s and 1880s furniture that we put in his 1884 uh, house. So uh, St. Paul is an interesting city to interpret because in that era, it's the frontier. It is beginning to develop. And just as we have the Dunsmuirs up here, we had uh, Mr. Hill with his great northern railway and various other uh, scions of industry and entrepreneurship. But thanks to Julian H. Sleeper, Mr. Hill still doesn't have a dressing room with a walk-in closet with a window. But the JHSH has it. So we keep waiting for Mr. Hill to catch up, but it just uh, doesn't uh, happen. So, uh, it's, and it's, sometimes it's important for visitors to see the upper middle class as it is, as it is developing in uh, an emerging urban culture. And yes, you should go to the homes of people who were wealthy and who showed that they were, but don't do that exclusively. So come to St. Paul, JHSH is one of those few museums where we are able to let you sit on most of the, uh, uh, of the furniture as uh, that East Lake was built so well back then that we can do it. So although it's, uh, we think, a, a very fine museum in, uh, in St. Paul, the head and the heart are still on the, uh, the various <coughs> coasts and uh, certainly in uh, what is in many ways my favorite uh, country, as people out here know, uh, my heart is in Victoria. It is uh, one of the uh, most important places in the history of uh, heritage buildings that can be <coughs> found. And there, there may be a resurrected project with which I will be able to prove that to you in uh, a year or so. We'll, uh, we'll see, we have to cut through the bureaucracy, but it may be possible. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, not a plug for myself, I'm not part of the story, but for Mr. Sleeper and his house and for the Gilded Age in that uh, other country. I'd like us to get James A. Garfield back, but it's not uh, happening. So, but uh, we, we try to uh, honor him as someone who was cut down in his prime and who is very versatile and very open-minded and very good for his country in the 49 years that he did uh, live. So thank you for putting up with that little commercial too. Other, other items before I, yeah. sir? How many people here are interested or have worked in the marine industry. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Tons, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, we pro and you all probably know more people who, uh, who have and who know, and uh, for whom it goes back uh, <coughs> generations and, uh, and generations. Uh, uh, true in your like, case? With her family, they started a lot of marine industry here in Victoria. And we, uh, and it, uh, I hope that a great deal of that has been, uh, has been preserved uh, uh, curatorially. It's, uh, it's, it's, well, as I attempted to prove that these countries could not have developed without the dedication of uh, people who uh, shaped their livelihoods and gave their lives in that direction. There's just no other way the, uh, any nation could have prospered without that uh, uh, sort of uh, dedication, <coughs> without that emphasis. Yeah? I just have one more question. You alluded to the fact you're writing some Canadian history. I'm sorry? You're working on history books related well, to Well, uh, there's, there's one project that's very Victoria-oriented. I, I got to uh, uh, beat the bureaucracy before I can uh, talk confidently about it. But uh, several deranged people have, uh, on both sides of the border, have encouraged me to uh, 
write memoirs of my incident, my adventures north of the border, some of them uh, humorous and satiric. I've warned them, don't encourage me to do that, you know what the result will be. So we, we hope to hack out almost Canadian <laughs> and uh, to have a uh, presentation from that uh, uh, book on possibly the next uh, trip to Craig Derrick if, uh, if the executive director knows what he's in for and, uh, and goes along uh, with that. But uh, someone who has gone to Yellowknife for the weekend to see it not get dark and other obvious things that one can do and uh, now I, I shan't uh, can't give you any uh, previews or, except hints that uh, the Amade Forget, the Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan, and his monkey just might be involved. So think about that for a uh, time. And then it gets worse from there. So we'll, uh, we'll hack out almost Canadian and uh, attempt to amuse you so when you come back you can bring objects to throw as long as it's easy for the great <laughs> Derek staff to uh, clean up after that. So uh, as uh, Johnny Carson said, more to come. We hope. <laughs> if, they, if they let me in the door. <laughs> Seth, thank, thank you so much on thank behalf you, Bruce. of the Society and for the half the folks here tonight speaking to us and uh, uh, watch our calendar perhaps next year that we'll have Seth back talking about one of these two books that he's working on. Or something else. Yeah. <laughs> if I get the yes. then, um, uh, no charges. Now, if anyone would like to see the castle, we can go over there. I'll uh, go and turn off the alarm and meet you under the portico chair. And I'll, I'll be there for about five minutes. The door will be open. But after that, after five minutes, it will be locked and you, you won't be able to come in. <laughs> <clears throat> so the clock is running. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll sit for a minute while you are while you have what you have said. <laughs> Said, what do you want? And they said, an ox cart. An ox cart roam 